Well, hi everybody. Thank you again for joining OpenGovCon. Uh, this panel I'm really excited about. Uh, it's near and dear to me. So what we're doing today is we've got a collection of folks that are going to talk about the DoD's effort to do platform engineering, um, which we started calling the Software Factory. And so this is a grand adventure where the department has started to adopt DevSecOps, and they wanted to find a way to uh, not have to recreate this uh, DevSecOps team, custom platform, unique skill set in every single program inside of the DoD, which is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of programs. And so today, you know, I'm excited just to kind of gain the perspectives from the team, and uh, we look forward to opening up for questions after just a, a couple of quick ones from me. So to kick us off, again, I'm Kyle Fox. Uh, I was in Air Force for about 14 years. I was with the Sentinel Weapon System, which is the ICBM replacement program, uh, $100 billion weapon system, and the first cloud-native DevSecOps-enabled nuclear weapon system, and uh, worked a lot with everybody up here. Uh, what I'll actually do is we're just going to do questions, and then everybody will do their intro as part of the, uh, the questions that I hand out. So let's start off with, you know, over the past three years, the DoD Software Factory ecosystem has exploded from only a handful of teams to nearly two dozen. Why has the ecosystem proven so popular, and what's next for this community? Anybody that wants it, go for it. I'll take the first, first shot at this. Um, so, hi, my name is Mark Galpin. I work at a company called Tidelift, which is about uh, building relationships, hopefully, between governments and open source maintainers. Um, but uh, before that, I've been doing other uh, companies in the DevSecOps space. And uh, before that, um, I was uh, one of 10 lead systems engineers on what was then the Army's largest software program, uh, a nice uh, ACAT1 program and all that lovely jazz. And I've been thinking about this and this question, Kyle, since you did give us this question ahead of time, and I was thinking about the fact that almost exactly nine years ago, um, the chief architect uh, of our government program got a, a service level award for uh, being the first um, ACAT program to implement agile practices uh, under the under the FAR, under some new changes in the FAR that had been made about oh, 12 years ago, I think it was, to start trying to allow agile practices, quote unquote. Uh, and we got this award because we had managed to push a release to the field in 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> so, Light, lightning fast, lightning fast. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think that really just answers your question right there, that you know, on the one hand, that was a really amazing accomplishment by the standards of an army software program. And on the other hand, um, I left uh, to go to industry about six months after that. And um, we pushed something to the field. Uh, a customer complained about a bug uh, at 3 p.m. and we had it in their hands at 9 a.m. Uh, <laughs> with a fix. And it's like, oh, this is the difference and this is why uh, we need to do better. And when I st started interacting with uh, with uh, Platform One um, back as it was just getting going, it's like, wow, this is this is finally enabling this great capability. Yeah, eighteen months to sub eighteen hours. That's that's awesome. Okay. Any other thoughts? No. Uh, I'll, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Because I'll take a, a swing at that. So kind of. The, in a similar vein. So I think um, for those of you that, that haven't worked with the federal government or haven't worked with the DOD specifically, uh, the DOD tends to be a, a little bit hierarchical. Um, we, we literally have, you know, chains of command drawn all the way up to the, the president in order. Um, they're on the wall of every building. So what happens is, you know, the when we talk about DevSecOps, well, we've got a dev community. That's the acquisitions community. We've got the, the security community. We don't really know where they are. Um, we've got multiple ops communities because you've got like the IT ops side of the house. And then you've got the actual end users. And uh, everyone kind of forgets about them. And so I think that what's actually powerful about the software factories um, is not even the technology. And that pains me because I'm, I'm the CTO at, at Platform One. But it's the fact that the users now kind of had a voice in the entire system. And, and so normally to get those requirements to go back into the acquisitions community to buy software, because even if you could deliver you know, 
every 18 hours instead of every 18 months and call it agile, um, you'd probably still have a requirements document that's 10 years old um, and, and wouldn't capture what you need. And you, you know, when I was at AFRL and I would go talk to people in the field, they're like, what I actually need to be able to do is right click and copy that text to the, the clipboard so that I can paste it into this other window. That's all I need. I don't need AI, I don't need ML. I need to be able to right click and copy. Um, and it takes like 20 years to deliver that. So I think what's made the software factory ecosystem really explode is the users having a voice in the software development. That's great. Yeah, I was actually going to say something similar there. Um, with So I, my name is Dan Fedek. I actually work at HashiCorp. Um, I am subbing for Armand, who's our CTO, which is kind of crazy. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. But um, I think the biggest thing that the software factories provide, as far as I'm concerned, while working with other organizations in the Air Force and the Space Force, is that the software factories are actually creating known artifacts that everybody else in, in the DOD can use. Or it, it, Actually, in the DOD is, is the right answer there, because in the Air Force, everybody's using it. But also, if I talk to anybody in the Army, Space Force, you know, the Navy, they're still using Iron Bank. They're still using Big Bang um, as some of these artifacts that are available to the rest of the DOD. And, that, and like Camden said, you know, the, the users are actually able to you know, make minor changes to those and then actually give that feedback back to um, the original program and the artifacts that are there. So the nice, if you think about you know software design and design patterns, so what the software factory is actually giving is those design patterns that are useful and then can be codified and then can be iterated on over time. So if you think about the there's a, the concept of the Spotify model. If you've heard of an application called uh, Backstage, so the idea is that I have this CI/CD workflow or I have a specific way that I do something and I I post that that workflow into a common repo. And then anybody can choose to use that workflow. And over time, the best ones end up moving to the top of the stack, right? So the, the workflow that uses GitLab and you know, has GitLab actions and you know, whatever workflows are being used that, that are the best ones are the ones that are going to be used the most. And that's kind of what the software factories are offering for the Air Force and the Space Force. So. Yeah, awesome. Good night. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, yeah, just to complement uh, what Major Katie brought forth. Um, I, I really think that uh, the explosion of essentially these teams across the space uh, represents, you know, pain essentially felt across the space, right? And so um, if we just kind of like invert the notion of pain and treat it as an opportunity, people rally around problems and opportunities to solve problems. And usually, um, what is the most important problem or opportunity to seize or problem to solve is the one that is the most proximal to you. And so if we just think about the concept of user pain and user experience and just like functionality of being able to achieve, you know, your daily grind, easing the pain of being able to deliver your daily grind is something that I think everybody is interested in. And so, you know, teams across the space, across the country, uh, being remotely constructed, et cetera, are a representation of that, you know, collective, uh, collective mindset to solve uh, problems and achieve, you know, the opportunity space. Yeah. Oh, I'm Bunny, by the way. Um, yeah, so I uh, support uh, Platform One in enterprise design, uh, specifically for the engineering side of the house, mostly. Um, great to be here. Awesome. OK, next. So the DoD has platforms approaching 100 years old, like the B-52, for example. The B-52, pulling on a thread, has computers that are roughly 40 years old. <laughs> so how has the DoD successfully approached bringing in modern technologies that may be four months old to operate in an ecosystem uh, with such diverse timelines. I think Mark could be a great starter. Sure. <laughs> um, so, fun story, my first boss, uh, back when I started as a contractor at White Sands Missile Ranch, um, I'm not gonna say how long ago, but uh, he had a uh, the decade previous, taken out the last punch card machine from the DOD um, in uh, the late 90s. Um, <laughs> so I was uh, 
thinking about Robert talking about the, uh, the eight inch floppies and thinking to myself, yeah, and I was using three and a half inch floppies uh, in production in the army in 2014. So um, when most people thought floppies were completely dead, it was uh, our best cross-domain solution because they had the, that little switch that you could set it from, uh, <laughs> from read-only to read-write. It's good UX. Isn't, um, that, isn't that still really awful, though? I mean. Yeah, I mean, so I guess part of the answer um, is I actually think this is something DoD is in some ways good at, yeah. is having, um, such a range of technologies, right? Like, I got to see at an ACAT one program. One of the things you get to see every once in a while is the logistics spreadsheet um, for basically every person with an Intel MOS in the entire United States Army, which is a lot, a lot of people, and all of the equipment they needed. And you get to see that you just have to, you know, some people get better equipment than others, and that sucks. But that was like one of the key decisions that you end up making, right, is that, okay, if you want to keep integrating new technology, you just have to kind of accept that it's going to take time, but that if you're willing to bite the bullet, it will lead to a better experience for the user 98% of the time. Hey, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you a question back? Of course. Okay. So uh, basically, um, my name is Cameron Bonoski. I'm with Sheepesh. Um, so uh, has policy, like from your perspective, like where where is innovative policy driving the ability for uh, the you know discardment of forty year old computers? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with, you know, what does the mission require, right? And we'll, we'll start with DOD, but it applies to anything. I mean, there's pressure to provide services. And for the DOD, the purpose is to keep the United States safe. And so with what we have, I agree with Mark. I mean, the DOD is incredibly scrappy, and it has made the best with what it's had, and it's been incredibly creative with those solutions. Now, as we start to see pressure um, to do better, right, there's more of a discussion on how do we look at one truly making the use the most optimal use of what's out there today and then two getting serious about how we do platform engineering work things like that to consolidate that also is true of hardware devices and starting to retire platforms um, my last soapbox thing on this i think this is an area where technology really helps us uh, we used to deliver monolithic applications that had a very tight coupling with hardware and you have to change everything to change anything now we've seen it abstract from hardware and we have services like Kubernetes that even abstracts it from the OS. So we're able to see quite a bit of change even though we're not having to influence the underlying hardware. Got it. Cool. Okay, I have, I have yeah. one quick comment there. So when I, I came, I actually went in the military in 96. And I was part of the DCGS program. And we were working on uh, basically U2 imagery, which almost every imagery analyst at the time was actually training on. So everybody knew how to look at a grainy piece of black and white uh, image and actually know it was behind that. This is a surface to air missile or whatever. And we went from that to the Predator, which was this, you know, video feed of people loading things into, you know, trucks or whatever. It was like amazing the difference, but they were still using that integration point of, hey, we still need to know that this is here and we still have this. So how do we, how do we use the old technology and the new technology in the same platform? And we did that through integration points. It's almost like software, yeah. uh, software development, right? So I need to be able to interact. I need to have those integration points. And I think that's you know one way that we, we just continue to build integration points between older legacy hardware and new hardware. That's awesome. OK. So I've got one for you, good sir. <laughs> OK, innovation in highly regulated, highly regulated environments, uh, such as the DoD, is clearly a huge challenge. You've heard about it. The story's up here. Um, if you could equip a federal software factory with a superpower, what would it be? Yeah, so so the superpower that I would give, you know, the, the software factory overlord, if you will, um, <laughs> would be the ability to look out into the world and just see this little halo around, this little glow around everyone out there in the world that the DOD or the federal government has empowered to tell that, that software factory overlord no. Um, and the reason is we, in, inside the federal government, for, for good reason, and particularly within DOD, we've empowered so many people to 
to stand up and say, nope, you can't do that. There, there's a law, there's a policy, there's, there's an opinion that, that says you can't do that. And where things fail is when you discover that late in the process. Um, and what I would love to do is if you could just look out and see everyone in the crowd that can possibly tell you no, you bring them to the table in the beginning and you say, okay, what is it you actually need here? And they're like, well, I need, I need 36 months to analyze your piece of software and decide if you can deploy it. I'm like, okay, but what do you really need here? Like, you don't need 36 months. There, there's something you're looking for during those 36 months. What if I can give you that in 36 seconds or 36 minutes? Um, I think where we've gone off the rails sometimes is when we, we get like 90% of the way through the process and all of a sudden those last 10 people that get to tell us no, that we've never met before, they walk into the room, they're like, okay, I'm here, you're done, stop. I love it, a decision clarity person, mm -hmm. right? that's a great, that's a great superhero. Um, Any other powers? Yeah, I mean, having just uh, either zero care, zero no, for who is who, uh, really has been helpful. Uh, arguably is what's gotten me to be able to talk to you today. Um, so uh, having kind of a fearlessness and a justified technical rationale for what it is that you're bringing um, uh, to say, uh, whether that be popular or not, um, and not caring who's on your email. Yeah, I, I echo that completely. I mean, um, I've heard many people say that Innovation in the Air Force is run by young captains with scissors, right? And it's this idea that, you know, our software factories, um, you know, they have very young professionals that are on these things. And it's amazing because they're interacting with, um, you know, three-star equivalents regularly. Uh, and that's something that's very different from a command and control military model. So it takes bravery to do that. The best superpower I'd like to give them <clears throat> is just a look into the future when they're successful. Ah. <laughs> because I think... The biggest thing for me, I see, you know, kind of getting to uh, Camden's comment about all the people that can say no, is all the people that say you just can't make this work. And I talked about being an ACAT one program. We talked about innovation and modernization. You know, us lead systems engineers would get together and talk about how can we do it. And so many times we were stopped by people who said, you know, this will never work or it's going to cost way too much. And there were so many of those things that I can say in hindsight with certainty, having been in industry and seen them in practice, that if we had stopped development for a year and done about half of them, um, it would have saved the Army money. Um, <laughs> right? Right. You know, like, yeah. <clears throat> and that's, I think, really what I want to give, the future superpower I'd love to give them is, you know, if you pull through this software factory model, it is going to be such a competitive edge for the United States military in the future that we're all going to, you know, wonder why it took so long to get there. Fantastic. It's worth it, person. I like it. I think uh, being able to jack into the matrix and, and upload all the Kubernetes code would be a pretty cool one. Red dress? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so the superpower I would bestow upon whomever would be the power to bestow the ability to ask the right question. Uh, so in my experience, um, people carry around a lot of assumptions that's you know, really founded on a baseline working knowledge, usually informed by either a functional role or their perspective where they sit in the world. And what I find you know, being a part of so many different types of engineering conversations is that, uh, you know, people sort of assume the meaning of a particular term, or we assume the issue on the table, or we even assume the outcome that we're after, um, and, you know, start getting to requirements or something like that. But we don't take the time to slow down and ask our questions, even if the questions, you know, are non-technical um, or seem out of scope uh, or seem dumb, right? Uh, the ability to ask the right questions to drive down to, you know, root cause analysis in order to determine outcomes, uh, and outcomes really being, you know, something, achieving something that is valuable, right, which is the concept of value in and of itself is very, very proximal uh, and rooted in reality. So, yeah. Yeah, I love that. So, clarity person, 
insightful person, bravery person, <laughs> and then uh, you know, hope, it's worth it. That's fantastic. Uh, so I really want to start dragging in some audience members here. Um, really fantastic panel that we have up here today, and we're curious on what questions are on your mind. I can call on folks. Okay. This is Asanya Sar. So I had a quick question. Like, there is actually a software effect is a very overloaded term, first of all. It depends on who you ask. It depends on who person does. Like a building a one pipeline, building only one application, I heard people are calling software factory. So I don't got a discussion. But my main question is, the other is more about the consumer of the product comes from the vendor perspective. We are not really building a lot of code in reality. But there is a good connection with the DevSecOps infrastructure software factory. We, in, we kind of incept, uh, accept the code or drops from the vendor. What do you start thinking is the benefits of DevSecOps of receiving the vendor drops to address the, one of the biggest things about the verification and validation, which we are receiving the code from the vendors. In reality, we have more code is coming from the vendors that versus we are producing in-house. Any thoughts on verification and validation? I have a lot of thoughts on verification and validation and arguably have spent a good amount of time digging into that question. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think that there is a good verification uh, mechanism in place today uh, that comprehensively could uh, account for source code provided by vendors that makes its way through some secure pipeline. Um, and I think it's sorely needed. And we heard CISA talk about transparency. Uh, that fundamentally breaks when you look at policy. Um, and what's needed is a new PKI for uh, this supply chain um, that enables a transparent view from A to Z. So. Yeah, the communication piece is key. I'm, I'm curious on. Uh, I'm curious on your thoughts of like, you know, in the seat today, platform one CTO. How is it going with vendors and customers? You know, trying to bring them in and participate in this uh, DevSecOps and platform engineering. Is, is, is it helping? Where are you at? Yeah. So I think it. So the benefits of of incorporating the vendors and getting those those code drops onto the platform. Um, really fall into to two spaces, I think. So one is the ability to work directly with the people instead of, of keeping them at arm's length. Um, whether that's the developers or the support personnel or whoever it is that, that you're working with from the vendor, um, it really shortens that, that feedback loop. And then two is the more internal feedback loop. So yeah, we're probably only writing maybe a, a single digit percentage of the actual code um, uh, within the software factory and sending it through through our pipelines. Um, but the advantage there is more that at every stage of the way, you know, on every merge, we are testing the integration with all that vendor provided software. And I think that's the, to me, that's the, the big change and the big win from the model where I get a delivery every 12 months, 18 months, 10 years, I, I get a drop from the vendor, um, and it's this big monolithic thing. I mean, it's, I've had source code mailed to me, like a printout of source code physically mailed to my address as a contract deliverable. Um, I've gotten, you know, how, binaries how, on disk. How uh, useless is that? Uh, right? I mean, I mean yeah. Um, yeah, this was not a long time ago. This is, <laughs> um, and so I think it's that constant integration piece. And, and so I don't want to find out what normally happens is I, I get the software and someone goes, okay, it got delivered in my mailbox. So I'll go ahead and sign that seed roll and I'll pay it out. Um, and then I hand it off to someone else that then has to go integrate it with the system that the end user is going to use. And I find out after I've already deployed it to production, when someone can't do their job, that it doesn't integrate right. I want to find that out like right now as immediately as possible. So I think that's the benefit of, even if I'm only writing a very small amount of, of code on my platform, it's, it's getting, it, getting people into CI and doing that integration testing is really where the, the win is. 
And what, uh, like, what, what are the requirements that you want to see from a vendor um, that gives you X bits? And like, what, what are you doing to verify those other than testing them against like logical unit tests? I mean, because arguably, you know, uh, that that's where the risk lies, in my opinion. Yeah, that's great. So, I've, go ahead. All right, hi, I'm on a Kransit contractor support to DOD CIO, and my question is, as you heard Rob in the last uh, talk say, you know, we're tracking about 50 to 60 software factories in the DOD. Um, and so, you know, we started, we have some, and now we want to get to where software factories, you know, are sort of the default. So I'd like to hear from you, what is your recommended steps to growing software factories to the point where that's our default way of doing business? I would flip the model of business over to innovative small companies that are allowed to do flexible scopes of work um, and then let the sustainment part happen with the companies that are doing that anyway, but really taking advantage of uh, uh, I guess the current model of lazy large integrators. Um, so letting integration happen with small innovative companies and um, letting them subcontract to large prime integrators as it is today and let them be the butts and seats that enable a sustainment model rather than letting them drive direction of any type of technical validity because they're profit driven by nature. Yeah, so I think what I would do is I would I would make it a, I would flip the competitive marketplace around within the DOD so that the folks providing software, uh, whether you're a program office or whether you're like AFWorks with the Cyber program or something like that, that users have a choice and, and are, you're competing for the users. So we see a lot of really bad incentives on like the internet overall where it's it's ad driven and things like that and so you're actually incentivized to like keep eyeballs on a page for for like one second so you get that ad payout or something um i don't want the dod to look like that but what i do want is like i have a mission to do and, and my mission might be you know in acquisitions to to write reports or or something like that it's still a mission if i could compete across or if i had a choice of different software factories to work with or different pieces of software to use to complete my mission. And then that got fed back into what programs are supported in the future instead of just getting something handed to me that I'm required to use. I, that If we could somehow make it a competitive marketplace within the DoD where I had like a DoD app store and the bad ideas would eventually fade and the, the good ideas would, would percolate to the top um, kind of the, the model that Dan was talking about earlier. That That's what I would do. Because I, I think you would find that where software factories deliver compelling value, they'd float to the top. And where software factories are really just a bunch of people that thought it was a cool idea to have a software factory because they, they got someone to draw them a cool logo. Like, if they're not delivering outcomes, they just won't be there anymore because people won't be using the stuff. I'm actually going to pull on, on money. So you yeah. had a really good comment on value earlier. So let's just pull on that, jam on that a little bit. How do you help a DevSecOps team um, articulate their value? So in design and design thinking, <clears throat> when it comes to understanding user experience, user pain, um, and the gap um, or the conflation of the two, uh, really what, there's one tried and true method. So, <laughs> and I'll just, I'll, I'll keep it simple um, since, you know, simplicity is, is beauty. Um, you don't ask a person, a user, what they want. Um, you don't even ask them what they're after necessarily. 
uh, you ask them what their experience is. And you're not supposed to do it by just asking, what is your experience, right? You ask, um, you first of all, uh, understand who you're going to be talking to. And then you understand the stakeholder that is responsible for delivering something to that person that you're going to be talking to. And you understand what that stakeholder cares about, right? And so that forms your questions going in. And having a subset of questions that gets after what the user is experiencing today actually lends insight into, you know, where are the breaking points? Where are the gaps in communication? Where does the process break down? Where is the tool not working? Um, where essentially is there disruption in the pathway to the user or the users or the teams uh, getting what they need to achieve their job essentially, right? Um, and so in understanding multiple perspectives, all feeding into delivering, you know, actual outcomes for the user subset, uh, you really establish what needs to be accomplished, right, in order to deliver to the user something usable uh, so that they achieve whatever it is that they need to achieve faster, better, healthier. I love that. You know, don't ask, but discover. That's great. Yep. Bye. Can I just add one more yeah, thing please. to that? Yeah. So the, the three main metrics from a commercial perspective is usually cost, the risk, and the speed to market. So in the, in the military, it's more speed to mission, right? So how fast can we get to mission? How, uh, how quickly can we do that, but also have policy and governance as a first-class citizen? And what's the best option there? And then, um, so cost, risk, so that's, and then speed. So lower cost, the lower risk, and the, the fastest to, to, to mission. So as we start to create um, competitive examples of CICD workflows and policy as code and infrastructure as code and you know credential management and identity management, all of those things, um, you know, we can create sp artifacts that allow for the rest of, you know, the platform teams in the U.S. or in, in the in the government um, to get to market fast or get to mission fastest. And and I think that's going to be the kind of competitive marketplace that we need to to really foster. Yeah, excellent. Hey, Kyle. Yeah. I did have an answer for Anna, if I could, yeah. really quickly. Um, so I would say three things. Uh, one thing is content generation. Uh, so understanding who the different stakeholders are uh, that are required in order to stand up a software factory, uh, whether it's program managers, uh, acquisitions folks, et cetera, they have lots of questions. They don't have anyone to ask, right? Um, so having uh, continuous content generation to answer those questions, to break it down in understandable ways from those functional roles, I think is number one. Number two, um, money, right? <laughs> Being able to... Uh, understand and relay to the participants across the space how much things actually cost by pointing to actual use cases, right? Uh, so that they can prepare their budgets two years in advance, et cetera. Um, as we know, the acquisitions, fiscal years, et cetera, uh, all requires advanced planning. And then the third is much in line with uh, what Camden mentioned, which is having a place for users across the space to uh, voice their their pain, their experience, their uh, failure to do something, right? And collecting those uh, those features or stories or whatever you want to call them, uh, so that vendors or software factory, you know, future potential software factory participants can say, "Aha, you know, I do that really well, or we do that." really well, we work in edge, or we want to work in edge, you know, we can go after that particular subset of issues, et cetera. So three things. That was great. So we're, we're right at time, so we should probably um, maybe take one more really quick question. Yep. Now was for online too. Hey, Austin, Brian, good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, so it's been a while since like the CATO movement of maybe 2016 and a lot of these innovations lately have been around optimizing for that security policy, identity, like what's the next big challenge? Cause we've kind of, and who, and who's championing it maybe as a bonus answer. Who 
what's it? How do you offer multi-cloud to the government in a consumable, easy way? How do you make cloud one, like a multi-cloud, like, like live up to its name? I won't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there it is, yeah. <laughs> maybe. So if I were to, to be a little bit of a revisionist historian here, I would describe the, the CATO journey, so continuous authority to operate journey, as what, what came out of inviting some of the, the smarter, more progressive secure, cybersecurity folks to the table and designing a process with them. And what came out of that was this continuous security, you know, guardrail system so that we could accredit a process instead of accrediting a particular series of bits that we were going to load into memory and, and execute. Um, I think the next big challenge is to pull in more communities and do continuous everything. So um, I've been talking with a few people at this conference about like uh, the test and evaluation community. How do we, we get them on board faster? But um, how do you do continuous acquisitions? So, you know, we talk about milestones, we talk about deliverables. How do we take the human, not make those a human subjective decision? And, and maybe, you know, we could actually bid out, what if we could bid out an algorithm or what if we could bid out a UI or, you know, some element and then automatically accept that after the fact. So just shrinking all those those big long cycles we have into shorter and shorter iteration loops. I think continuous everything is, is what I would say the next thing is. And and yeah, next step would probably be the the DTOT community, getting them on board the way we did the cybersecurity community. That's awesome. So we could I said a short question, but you know, thanks for throwing out CATO. Um, thank you again. Let's just give it a, a round of applause for this awesome panel.